All right. I hope I haven't covered this uh, <laughs> area before. I'm thinking I have a little bit, but maybe not too much on the subject of copying masters. I, I know I've covered the territory of starts, and I'm going to talk a little bit about starts in here, but there, I mean, there are some obvious reasons to copy the... Uh, if you want to learn something about somebody's methodology to get the early phases of their work, not just the finish. But let's just let's listen to uh, Tia and um, see what um, the thoughts are here. In the meantime, Jimmy C., thank you. And uh, Theodora, yep, this is, uh, you made it, your donation made it over to us. So thank you, guys. You're much appreciated. Let's just uh, pick right up. Um, so often I've heard um, people talk about the value of master studies. But what people are studying there is the end result, not the intense labor of the process. Now, I might jump through paintings here as I show you, as I talk about this, but that is, that is what you might be talking about. But um, if you copy starts or if you copy unfinished works, you might be doing it for the purpose of delving into the process. Um, it is true, though, that, the, that you might that the primary thing you're looking at is that final product, and so is there a reason uh, to study the final product for its own sake? And of course, you know there is. If a person is to study these works, is it not more important to understand the order by which the painter took to arrive there? So that's the study of starts. For example, did Sargent paint the head primarily first, or only in part before adding color to the rest of the portrait? Good questions, excellent questions. Uh, the end result is the culmination of a composition and not the much more valuable lesson of the road taken in arriving there. Now, I'm always talking about best practices and, and arriving there, that road you're talking about. That place you're arriving is a place that you've determined. <clears throat> it's your own personal aesthetic. So looking for best practices, <laughs> Yeah, you can look at how other people approach things, how they, what they, you know, how they drew first or didn't draw first, and how much went on. Um, but so much of this does depend on what you're you're going to have to discover best practices for yourself. But studying masters, how might I study masterworks in this way? I'm I, I'm preoccupied these last few days about this question more and more. Well, that's just the first part of it. Uh, and I'm just going to jump into it, but let's get, talk. Here's the second part of, of uh, the question from Ty. I, I know that I don't want to imitate any painter. That's good. But I do wish to understand their labor. To me, to complete a finished painting has always been the point, but a finished work degrades into a thing which sits in a corner, and so the middle part of any work becomes the most interesting part. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing to say. There is something wonderful about process, isn't there? As part of the delight of being a painter is being able to 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 move this thing through from from absolutely nothing to a magnificent end <laughs> that hopefully doesn't wind up in the corner. <laughs> this is what I want to learn about in relation to the study of the masters. I have understood more and more about other people's work simply from progressing my own. Now that part I really. I like. I'm, I'm really, it's a very profound statement. You really do understand other people better if you're trying to paint from life yourself. Um, and, um, you know, I've often thought that if you can't, if you haven't mastered nature, you're not going to master the masters because what they're doing is so directly connected to nature. And so for to really truly understand them, you have to understand the masters. So, I'm just loving what you're saying there. Pre keep progressing on your own, but progressing especially in the study of nature and progressing in, of course, the management of paint and um, all that sort of stuff. But a lot of that technical stuff is, it is possible to see a certain look on the surface of something, like the edge-free look of some of these uh, Dutch still lifes. And... Um, and want to sort out for reasons how to paint that. And it could take a serious amount of time uh, of experimenting uh, and so on. But um, there's a lot of surface information, though, so don't underestimate it. I'm talking about the thickness of paint. I'm talking about if you're looking at a painting that's cracking, you might, you might want to study for something, but it may not be for the medium they used. 
Nevertheless, the way I think about this question is as if a painting or a piece of music, and I'm trying to understand the notes within one passage to the next, uh, why this note and not another? Now, that's the beginning of a different question. That has to do with more of the Impressionist search model, um, if the, the way you're saying that. And don't make sure it's always clear in your own mind whether you're really <clears throat> making that kind of painting or if you're making an imaginative painting. The... Uh, the first pictures I'm showing you here, the um, Tintoretto, I was disappointed in finding that Tintoretto looked like it had been skinned. It's at the museum at the Fog. I have no idea when it might have happened if it was. Oh, oops, I forgot to frame that left one. Sorry, guys. I, I really try to be careful to frame paintings, especially when they get dark and you start losing the edges. Um, but these are both Tintorettos, and the one at the Fog, the one on the right, is um, you can see where there's a, oh, it appears to be on a browned, brownish panel and there's some line drawing, you know, just classic contour drawing. Uh, and then highlights, it looks like the, the beginning of hitting highlights and that sort of thing. And and then painting different parts. Uh, uh, who I don't know why the legs are skinned off, as it were. Uh, I've seen that happen in my lifetime. I've seen paintings wrecked by museum, um, uh, uh, or whatever you call them, <laughs> call them restorers, but they come in, what did my restorer uh, uh, employer say to me? They come in orchids and leave roses, or they come in roses and go out orchids. <laughs> um, tongue in cheek, I'm sure. But uh, obviously you could study the, the painting on the left as a composition. You don't even have to paint. You could study that as a composition in the sense of the main line. And you sit there and copy just for the purpose of meditating on these things. It's a it's it's a very wise thing to do. Uh, but that copying, you see that done by Sargent, Degas. There's examples in many of their books where these guys have obviously just stood back in a museum and made some notes to themselves about, and that's a version of copying as well. Um, but to see a drawing, I mean, a painting like the one, the Tenoretto that's on, that now is unfinished, looks like it's been skinned, uh, is to see how he may have uh, laid in the whole panel. And there is some evidence that Titian, if not always at times, did that. Took the whole panel and just drew on the panel and then began to paint right into that, um, whether dry or not, I don't know. Or maybe different at different times. But that's a kind of thing you might learn by looking at either skinned pictures or unfinished ones. If you look at this one by Drummond, James Drummond, this is an 1800-something, maybe a painter, uh, you can see this guy does fully finished figures on a middle gray ground. Uh, he's got enough of the drawing there. Let's see if it's all there. And uh, he just simply simply seems to be working up the figures. Um, this, um, oh yeah, <laughs> this is this is this does appear to be something for this picture. That's funny. I didn't pick that up when I when I dragged the pictures out. And again, I've forgotten to put a, a line around that one. Um, Still, you can you can see that this in the process here, he's painting up piece after piece after piece after piece. Now, I've seen Gamble do something rather like this, but I'm going to show you something a little different. But this isn't to, so much to talk about starts, though, and I don't want to get confused about that. But what can you learn um, by copying? Well, in this case here, you could learn how much work could be done um, in a piecemeal manner. You know, one little thing itemized at a time uh, through the entire through the entire painting. So you could see that somebody has done that, uh, and and I see evidence of illustrators uh, not unusually doing. It. I've done it myself at least once for an illustration. Um, I think it was something of a George Washington or something, and uh, I just simply painted from the head down to the foot. Um, there wasn't much more needed in the picture, but. Um, yeah, so that's, again, you're just having to look to understand what they might have done. What are you going to learn from the surface of this? I don't know. But this isn't a picture like the, um, let's just jump over to the Jerome for a second. There's a Jerome here where you can see that the process is wildly different. And this is really appreciated. This is one that we seem to have been, something, a connection was made for us, probably by, by a gamble through Paxton from Jerome. And uh, the, um, but you can see this whole painting is being worked up at once, right? Um, yes, the center of interest area worked up more 
and that and that was all information to us. So, in just seeing these, but again, that's not copying, is it? That's not a discussion of copying. That's just a process. But if you want to know what somebody does in, as an impressionist versus what they do as an imaginative painter, this this is the this this is some of the th material you want to have seen. <coughs> That's not what you wanted to see, though. So let's just talk about what you might copy. So here's, um, would you copy these? This would be the, these are both sergeants, and both of them are in a very, what I would call a very preliminary phase. Uh, they could be worked up more. Are they studies for something? Are they just simply works that never got pushed? Um, but the one at the bottom is a superb example, and you might copy it just to see what he didn't paint, for example. And what he did paint, this answers to some degree your question of whether he put colors in just the face. Well, in the start, you can begin to see that. He's got the greater color note here, the greater color value of the background with whatever somewhat movement, the greater color of the hair, and that color movement through the, through the uh, flesh. And, uh, and, and this is another example like it in which the background is obviously intended to imply the, the texture of leaves and that sort of thing, but he's not evolving that so that's something you might pick up uh, from that the fact that, that that people do paint in more openly um, at times and don't simply start you know do what that previous painter we looked at uh, you know do, doesn't just slick it right up from the beginning so to speak as if it were all he knew how to do was to and by the way I was gonna say to do this one of the things you might learn to do is that I was going to mention Gamble because Gamble would have a platform in which the models were going to be lined up. And he'd probably mark the floor for one of them, then he'd, or might even pose two of them at once. And then he would paint one after the other more fully like this. Now, my evidence is that he painted them more like the Jerome, didn't paint them all the way up, and then went over and took over sections of it. He would say he'd paint an area at a time, but that could mean so many things. But so you might pick up that if you're looking at these guys and you could copy these starts by Benson up on the right and Tarbo on the left. That's one of those ways that I began to understand that it was the Boston School start that told me that gave meaning to a lot of those uh, paintings if you're coming out of a fog and other kinds of ideas. Uh, so one of the things I would say to you, you know, when you're copying is if you if you're also reading and you have material in front of you, if you're trying to find process information. It really, it really serves you well if there's information that's actually legitimate. That's one of the reasons, I mean legitimate meaning not just passed down and rumored. Um, but one example, um, uh, what was I reading? Yeah, I can't remember. Um, um, but, but if you could find somebody who's in the, just the previous generation, for example, when Gamel was talking to us about what Paxton did, we didn't have Paxton there, but we had paintings by Paxton. And Gamel was pointing out things that he did. That This figure right here is an example of it, the bottom one. And Gamel had another painting in there. Uh, I copied at another point, the, uh, which I've talked to you all about, the, um, the, the, the new necklace, and I copied that for a client. But... Uh, but I was very eager to see how much work and what kind of work went into that kind of finish. So it's one of those things you can copy a painting for to a finish to find out just exactly the degree of, of, of as it were, finish, or some, someone else might say detail, uh, goes into that sort of a painting. There's a lot of information of that sort that can be had. So that's, don't take for granted that the surface information isn't important. But process and surface, there's two different things, right? You can tell by what people's last notes are frequently because that's not what their first notes might have been. On the other hand, if you're talking about the Boston School guys, you can see in this, in this lower one by Paxton that his early notes are intended to be very beautifully like, what's, like the skin of the color you see in front of you. And again, that's just like the, uh, the uh, sergeant here on the left. You can see that he's really pursuing the, uh, the beauty of the skin color relationships and, and the relationships of the other colors, the, the color scheme. And uh, this start by Paxson, which I'm guessing is perhaps three days in, um, is so beautifully worked up. It, and it's being, you can, you can understand by copying, by just looking again, you don't have to copy these things. But what you're looking at on the surface, it may not be what you get at the end. 
So I'm showing you this one on the right because when I copied the new necklace, I started it rather like loose and like this. And then I finished it just like Paxton does with this idea of, of the Angian or the, or the um, very articulate modeling of the, um, of, the, uh, of the Leonardo sort of school. Uh, you know, a very particular drawing in small ways around the eyes, not suggestive, not, not what Hale talks about with talking about certain aspects of either Velasquez or Vermeer. So, um, so just being able to see this, even to copy it and see what he's achieving in this phase is very beneficial. And then knowing that it's going to be more, even more refined in the final version of it, but it tells you this, this is not just some dull, monotonous picture. Again, I'll take you back over to the, to the, um, both of these, this one in particular, probably, and this has the drawing in the background, which is for the building like this. Um, but this has that feeling of being a long way from what he intends the final colors to be like. Um, more broad, more generic, you know, not worked up. He does work up color beautifully in the skin and other places, uh, Jerome does, not to take anything away from him. And, but this, this thing here on the bottom, uh, uh, the thing in person looks like living flesh, looks like the light of that day. It's, and this isn't, doesn't do it any justice, even a little bit, but if you want to see that in the MFA, again, that's one that would give you, if you copy it, you get some idea where they worked, where they didn't work, and uh, the sorts of levels and type of, of information they're bringing in by, the, say, the third skin, and the third day. Let's leave it at that. Um, but I copied a head by Paxton just because I wanted to understand the palette, and that's another reason you can do it. Yes, it's the final day, but it's but it's still the same palette. The guy's using whatever palette is on there, and I learned that the palette that for the painting I was copying was remarkably uh, heavy with cadmiums, which something that Gamble implied was not the case that it, that uh, we'd be using earth tones. Those tones, I tried it with the earth tones. I did everything I could to make those notes to match those notes. I couldn't do it without actual cadmiums. Yeah, I'm talking about certain of the reds, like in places like this. So what else? Um, this Paxton copied um, this painting by... Now, this, this is his copy, apparently. But this was copied at the uh, Fog in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts by Paxton. And it was copied from one end to the other, just literally noodled right up. I don't know if he did it for... Um, for for hire, or if he did it just for his understanding. But Jerome is definitely a guy whose fundamental thinking is is articulate form in the, of the classic sort. It's Angian thinking. And um, as much as he might have started like this, <clears throat> and it's doubtful that Ang started like this. <laughs> I don't see any evidence of that. Um, this has that influence of the Boston School and of Monet and all that sort of stuff where the color begins to be this whole field, this operation. And it's this would, this is also a in situ setup where this would have been pieced together again imaginatively. So each of the parts of this thing would have been done separately. You still might, to copy that by Ang to, and to get his color scheme, you might lay this thing in like this figure right here if you're, if you're copying as a Paxton. I don't know if this means anything to you guys. It, there are things about the uh, skin on the surface of the paint, you know, or how he gets light effects. And you'd say to yourself, oh, I see he's doing it that way. I wonder what the medium is and that sort of thing. And I wonder if I can get it this way, meaning my way. And Paxton's, you know, simplest is the best. Angs, <coughs> Angs believe the same thing, by the way, that the simplest, uh, the simplest, me you know, the, the more medium free is the better way to go. This was in the galleries with us uh, when we, we were students. It was in Gamal, sorry, in Gamal Studios. Uh, and this is a Paxton too, and you wonder to what extent it was it was it was post this, you know, post studying this, or if he studied this with the idea of doing some figures, some nudes. Um, so there's yeah. Why did why did Paxton copy that? Why what would he get from that? He wasn't going to get method from it. He didn't go undoubtedly if he did it like this. He didn't go around and draw the figure all the way out, and then go around losing significant parts of it. The other, but there's still a question, of course, of how much drawing was done. Um, well, we've talked about these guys here, and we, it's very evident that there wasn't careful contour drawing going on in these kinds of drawings, in these kinds of, of, of things. The drawing is much more organized around the leading edge, that sort of thing that I've discussed with you so many times. 
But you could begin to learn that. Uh, one of the things you might also consider doing if you're copying something is actually set somebody up in person in the same lighting while you're copying the, the thing in nature, you know, from a, from a painting in the museum and, make sh- and, and look at nature, study nature side by side. There's, there, there are things to learn that way. I'm just being, you know, lecturing. I, there's, there, there's so many reasons to copy. To find out how much paint people use is a reason to copy. And again, how much did they use in the middle phase? I remember asking Gamble. We saw a start like this in person uh, in Gamble's studio, and it was unfinished. And I, I was doing the, uh, uh, you know, looking at the um, finish of the new necklace, which is considerably more like this. And I said, well, how did he get from this to that? And this was very crude and rough. And Gamble said, well, there are many dodges. He may have sanded it. And we're talking about getting down to that smooth surface. That wasn't one that I bought into. It just didn't make any sense that you would do that if you're if you're intentional. This and the other reason to say that is because this one is very smooth and not done like this with crispy, crunchy, built-up impressionist uh, uh, broken color. Here's a, a Soroya, and uh, again that question of what you do first, second, third. But if you have a start, it's a lot easier to tell what a guy might have done. I was always interested in this one from the point of view of how much drawing he did in parts. There's a whole sense of this being a pot over here and a and a butt over here, and, you know, and some drawing here less and some more. Um, this does appear to be a complete setup. On the other hand, there's a lot of work. The outdoor stuff, in particular, looks by Sor- by Soroya look, look, looks like it was done a little bit like that Tenoretto, like with real drawing done way before him. A fair amount of drawing done before him. Uh, the way Carolus Duran appears to have done. And then, um, and you, but again, you can read that Carol Duran did that. You can also read that Sargent put down spots of color and gradually brought them to each other to the drawing. That's stuff you can read about. So if you're trying to make copies, you know, it depends how you're trying to inform yourself. Looking for best practices, though, is one of the great reasons. Yeah. I took um, some of the what I took from uh, looking at these, you know, you, you don't have to copy these to look at them, but there's a, a certain amount of paint that he's using. Uh, um, you begin to realize there's something of a kind of a medium in some of these things. And uh, he's using more or less of something in the direction of a combination of oils and, um, and varnishes, uh, potentially. And because I couldn't get certain of the effects when I copied that Bouguereau by, um, uh, without without, uh, and I could almost do it, but it was it was just a little more like when I put the least bit of a medium into certain places in, in that uh, in that copy. This That's this one right here. I had the actual thing in my hands in the, and copied it side by side in the, um, um, in my studio in Boston. But uh, that one I copied for the purposes of just understanding his palette. I was trying to find out what, exactly uh, he palette he used just for my own information and that was similar to what i did with the copying the paxton i was trying to find out what paxton's palette was to get those really rich cheeky colors the one on the right uh which is i don't know how big that is it's got to be at least 60 inches i think it might be more than that uh it's by um by our friend john white alexander and I copied that for a client, and that was one that I learned a lot from. And that one, the first thing I learned was just look at this heavy, heavily woven canvas. It was one of the roughest things I've ever seen. And by copying it, I began to realize the potential for for making lost and found marks with greater um, fluidity. I guess would be the way to say it um, by having a more a heavier, a heavier um, um, uh, grade canvas. I mean, this was the heaviest thing I've ever seen, um, and I've seen other ones by him, but they're just basically burlap, if you know what that is, like a burlap sack. Um, but this is also evidence to me of the common thread there in the Boston School of Visual Order Thinking, uh, that approach to things um, that had shifted from, uh, from pure outline and making objects, as in sort of a, there's an ideal, you know, uh, of folds and an ideal of whatever to the uh, more the greater sense of mystery that can be produced by the chiaroscuro model as it developed and evolved in the uh, 
in this phase, and Boston School is full of that, you know, just painting what you see, but meaning versus what you don't see. Um, and I, I mean, in other words, you're not trying to show all sides of the model. You're, you're enjoying the mystery. And this is a, this is a pretty dismal story, very, a very uh, touching uh, story of a woman gone mad a bit uh, because of the, the way her brothers uh, killed her boyfriend. Uh, there's more, you know, it's the Boccaccio story. You can look it up. It's, it's long and tedious. But the, um, the upshot is right here where she's got her friend's head in the, in the pot, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty disturbing. But that sense of mystery and, and the dimness, this is, this is kind of a too light a rep reproduction. But that one of, this is like one of the huge advantages. You can see how lost and found works, how shadows can be flat. Uh, this is an opportunity to actually see how to do that in paint. These would be the kinds of reasons I might have, you know. But I tell you, the main thing you want to do when you copy is have a reason to copy. And, uh, you know, if you if copying for composition is a good reason, this thing is a beautiful little composition here. It gives you a, a heads up on the on the uh, on the Art Nouveau line. There's a very elegant thing that goes on with Art Nouveau, that pre -de pre deco thing, and. And, it, and this is a remarkable place to actually begin to understand it and to engage it and really enjoy it. That'd be a reason all by itself to copy this, just to get a feeling for that line. Sargent's own work has a fair amount of that feeling for that elegant, um, sweeping line that I think of as nouveau um, and, uh, or an aspect of that uh, era. Um, but, you know, have a reason to copy it. Composition's a really good reason. Color schemes, copy them for color schemes. You see both Degas and others, Sargent, doing that same thing. You, you don't have to copy extensively. And now in the composition sense, you don't have to do a fine study of these things to understand the bigger aspects of composition. The great distribution, the power of, of, of the center of interest and how the diminishing how it diminishes and you know or the main line ideas and things like that but you do need to put meditative time in studying them to begin to understand them and so if it's compositional if it is just the surface that's a really good reason and you say it well yourself you don't really want to pay somebody else you know you're not trying to do this the only reason you copy somebody for the, from the point of view of methods is because you might find you're not getting a good quality uh, edge the way nature presents and you go find one in a painting somewhere and copy it and find out what that feels like under your hand under your brush so there'd be good reasons like that we're almost to the end of this i think now one another reason is to copy for color schemes i think i've mentioned that and uh, this is pro i don't know if this is that kind of a copy or this is actually a Leighton himself Leighton himself <laughs> i think it might be Leighton but if you copied Flaming June, you might wind up with something like this. That'd be a reason to copy his painting, Flaming June, just to study the color, just to don't go into the little drawing and spend f forever on it if your motive is to understand his color scheme. But this is much more of a generalized schematic thing and sort of a pretty kind of a version of it. And of course, these reproductions online, are, who knows what they are. But what you see in the final version might be even more beautiful to you. And that one would be worthy of a copy for you. And and if you're when you as you're trying to understand color schemes, look at pictures like that. Cop put the time in meditating, as it were, by copying, to understand their color schemes. Absolutely, do that. You know, as much as you say that about the surface stuff, the surface stuff is is why we become painters. And then there's a lot of other stuff that's technical that uh, it's you, it's so it's so helpful if you get good at it. I think that's what we've got though for today. So. Um, Ty, I hope that's something of interest. And if I've done this precisely before, forgive me all because I didn't want to look back. I had, I'm under a deadline here. I'm behind already too. So forgive me, but uh, I hope that's something different and something interesting. And, um, uh, but in the meantime, don't, don't despise copies. Just, I will. I think you'll get sick of them really soon if you just start doing a bunch of copies. And if you, copy, if you don't copy in museums, I hope you get sick of them really soon because you need the original. You need, this, you need to see how the paint works. 
You need to see what he's really doing, what his real palette is, not something that flashes into your eyes from an online image. And so if you're going to copy, copy directly. Find one somewhere. There's dealers around that they'll let you sit in their space if you can find enough good light. You, you ideally would copy them in the light they were made in, like natural light. Uh, and, you know, and just go from there. But, um, you know, as I said, have a really good reason to copy. And um, and and um, even, even if you don't, if you just like a picture, that's a good enough reason. You may never paint one like that, but you may just try to, you want to get your head around why you like this thing. Uh, so on. Yeah. I mentioned to you before that I copied a, um, a drawing by by Raphael because I just wanted to get, I just didn't like the way the marks I made looked. They were just crummy and I saw this beautiful Raphael. And the line mark, the, mar the quality of the mark was so beautiful to me that I thought I need to copy this. And I copied it literally, so to speak, from one end to the other with the idea of just getting to know his line. And by the time I got done, I felt like I owned his hand. I felt like I was practically stealing his hand because when the line went down, I knew exactly in my muscle, I knew exactly what it took to produce that line, that line quality. So, you know, there are really good reasons <laughs> to copy, but to copy these extensive drawings, just copy from one end to the other over and over again, I don't know what that is, and I don't believe you're going to spend, I think you'll get sick of it really soon. I mean, there are people who spent their whole careers making a living copying pictures. I don't, whatever, that, that's, that's fine, but that's not in the same class as a person who's trying to become a really good painter. For to, to do that, there's a lot of, as it were, secrets in the uh, masters, but most of it's not as lost as you think and and uh, but and some of it can be gotten through starts some of it studies for you know and all sorts of early preliminary and other kinds of work and then but again never over underestimate what you're seeing on the surface yeah okay i don't think i've done a pretty good job a very good job with this but i wish you well and uh, thank you for the question and your patience with me getting to it We'll see you all in the next one. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the 21st, which I think it is, and it's the Thursday before Christmas. We're doing a live one. So that's just, what, not much more than a week away now. Uh, so maybe, what is it, 10 days or so away. So we'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you again, Jimmy C. and Theodora. Thank you so much for those kind contributions to our, to our habit here. All right. Take care now.